Dasra, as you know, means enlightened giving. And the next two people who are going to be having the conversation pretty much embody enlightened giving. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'd like to call Peggy Dulaney to the stage. Uh, she founded Synorgos Institute in 1986 to work on a lot of things, but two of which were discussed today, which is to foster trust and collaboration among key stakeholders in order for us to achieve the success we have, which is NGOs, governments, and the private sector. And she also founded the Synorgos Global Philanthropist Circle to work with philanthropic families in their mission. And Amit Chandra, who in one avatar is the MD of Bain Capital Mumbai, but at Dasra, we know him as someone who is very detail-orientated, working with us on drought relief. And on top of that, he's also a trustee for Tata Trust, uh, founder and governing board member of Ashoka University. Thank you. Ladies first, or? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, we had a chance to speak a little bit ahead of time. Yeah, we did. And we found a certain amount of synchronicity in yeah. our thinking. But I think that Mr. Chandra's thinking is... Please call me Amit, Peggy. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think Amit's thinking is very precisely related to India. And so I think what we agreed is that you would begin yeah. with yeah. some observations, and yeah. I would make some, and then we'd have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to be the last session of the day, uh, and hold, holding up the rear is always a challenge, but we'll try to do our best. <clears throat> you know, the, the topic for this session is uh, reimagining uh, philanthropy. Um, and so uh, Peggy and I are going to try to uh, uh, lay out a few uh, themes, uh, you know, as we were catching up just before this. Uh, we realize that uh, we have uh, pretty much common themes for how we look at the years ahead. Um, you know, I often um, uh, uh, exhibit the uh, ever optimist in myself uh, when I say that this is probably the golden age of Indian philanthropy. Uh, I think uh, the future looks uh, incredibly bright. Um, and uh, the reason I say so is uh, I think first of all, um, uh, on the four themes that I'm going to talk about on reimagining philanthropy, the first theme probably is where uh, uh, the future looks the brightest, which is uh, how much to give. Um, I think uh, on how much to give, uh, we are very interestingly poised at this point of time. Um, you know, India in many ways uh, was supposed to be uh, the place where uh, uh, you know uh, philanthropy in many ways took root. Um, this uh, very room, as you get down, you see the bust of uh, Jamshedji Tata, uh, who, along with the Rabji Tata, were uh, legendary philanthropists uh, dating back to the times of Andrew Carnegie. Um, and, you know, they were, uh, the Tata family, of course, gave away most of their wealth at a time when most people were not uh, doing that. It wasn't fashionable to give away all your wealth. Uh, but after that uh, came a long period when. Um, um, you know, we didn't see uh, most of wealth being given back to society. Um, I think finally we're getting to a stage where, uh, again, uh, we're beginning to see uh, people giving back uh, large parts of their wealth. We've had a number of signatories uh, to the Giving Pledge. Uh, we've had a number of others who are actually engaged in those conversations. And very importantly, outside the billionaires, we've had a number of professionals uh, who've uh, actually given away very large uh, percentages of their, uh, of their income, a uh, number of whom I personally work with. And very importantly, uh, many who've actually given up their careers in their 40s and their 50s to move full time to, their, to the social sector. Um, and I know that. There are many who are not wealthy who are engaging with uh, the social sector in very interesting ways, whether through volunteering or uh, even you know, giving uh, meaningful parts of their income, even if they don't have uh, capital. So this, uh, on the first dimension, which is uh, how much to give, I think is probably uh, a very, very promising time. 
On the second dimension, uh, which is uh, how to engage, uh, again, I think uh, we are beginning to see, uh, 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 you know, some very interesting, um, uh, you know, dialogues and uh, styles emerging. Historically, uh, you know, in at least in India, uh, we've had most philanthropists. Uh, be grant writers, check writers, uh, whether it is uh, you know religious giving or even supporting foundations, we've generally not seen people really uh, you know demand accountability or roll up their sleeves and try to solve problems. Um, but something different has happened in the last few years. We're beginning to see a lot of conversations emerge um, between donors and uh, NGOs. And sometimes we've actually seen people uh, roll up their sleeves and uh, become problem solvers themselves um, and set targets for solving problems. And I think that is truly, truly interesting. Uh, much like what's happened uh, in the West with uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates deciding to actually eliminate certain problems themselves, I think we're beginning to see certain uh, early evidences of that uh, here as well. And I think that, when I think of reimagining philanthropy in India, I think I can see over the next decade or two, um, I can see some problems getting solved because there are probably a few people out there who are going to you know, uh, solve some of our most sticky problems which have persisted for decades. So those are two very interesting dimensions, dimensions on which I think philanthropy is going to get reimagined in India. And then there are two others which, Peggy, I know you're um, you know, deeply uh, involved with as well, which I think are interesting. One is the role of technology. I think uh, philanthropy is going to get reshaped extensively uh, by technology in India. Um, I think technology is, of course, going to reshape virtually every facet of our lives but I think it's going to reshape uh, you know, philanthropy in India probably more than it reshapes philanthropy everywhere else. And that's because we forget that um, you know, data consumption in India per capita is twice that of China, uh, thrice that of the US. It's cheaper to use data in India than in any other country of the world. We're adding 100 million uh, subscribers uh, at the rate uh, we are currently going in India. And so we're really going through a massive data revolution here. And um, particularly with the advent of usage of um, applications in vernacular languages, which is what has happened over the last couple of, over the last year, um, we're actually going to see technology unleash itself in India with, and with artificial intelligence applications, et cetera. I think we're going to see very, very interesting things happen in philanthropy is going to allow people from small towns to get to become a lot lot better at what they do and you know do things in a very different way last night i was a, i attended uh, the marico innovation uh, uh, council awards and it was fascinating to see a not for profit uh, group from a small town in tamil nadu which had actually, which was when, while these guys were in school, they were teenagers, they launched actually the world's smallest uh, satellite. It was the size of a gulab jamun, which is an Indian sweet. They're now a not-for-profit and they're raising money from philanthropists to keep supporting their activities. They were able to do this largely relying on, on the internet. So I think that's the power of what technology can do. So that's the third dimension, in my view, on technology and what it's going to do to help not-for-profits get better. And then the fourth, of course, is collaboration. I think historically, not-for-profits have just not spoken to each other, and philanthropists have avoided collaboration like the plague. Um, I think we are beginning to see early signs of people talking to each other in India and with some great, fantastic results. Uh, in my introduction, uh, you know, they mentioned that uh, uh, I'm a founder of Ashoka University. It's a, you know, it's a really interesting uh, example. Shashank here is also one of our founders. 
Uh, we are 120 people who have got together to build a world-class university in India. Um, and it would never have happened. Each one of us individually is not capable of building a, a university. But 120 people getting together has made a dream possible. And I think that's just one example of what the power of collaboration is. And of course, the biggest power of collaboration is when we get together and do things that are subscale individually, but in collaboration with the government. Because philanthropy can do things subscale, but government can do things at scale. And I think what Nandan Nilankani and his team have done in collaboration with the government to build the entire India stack, which is the world's biggest technology experiment is just phenomenal. So I think the power of collaboration is the other fourth theme that I think is going to be really interesting. Let me end my monologue here and hand back to you. Thank you, Amit. <clears throat> so I'll pick up on the theme of collaboration, which is actually the basis that Synergos was born on. Uh, 30 years ago, the word synergos comes from the Greek working together. And that has not been easy. And following it over the last 30 years, I have some observations about what makes it possible, which I hope will be, in fact, part of the future of philanthropy. So one of the things that we've discovered is that a lot of people live in their own silos and often inside themselves live actually in fear or shame or trauma. And that somehow impedes the ability to create relationships of trust, which are actually quite fundamental to creating collaboration. So one of the things I would like to see, and I think I do see it happening increasingly, is that people take the opportunity to build safe containers within which people maybe of different orientations from different sectors or levels of society can come together and get to know each other and see a common problem through each other's eyes, which really means developing a sense of empathy. But that can only happen if they're feeling safe enough to open their hearts and really listen and empathize with other people. So the creation of trust in order to move forward together is the first point that I would make. Secondly, I believe very strongly that philanthropists are in an excellent position to be the kinds of leaders that this world, which is quite broken in terms of the trust and in terms of people being able to work together across divides can be, and that is what we call bridging leaders. And some of the characteristics of bridging leaders are that they are able to listen deeply to others, that they're willing to reach out across their different divides, and that they're also interested in and able to convene people from different groups in that safe container so that they can develop this trust. So if you think about the qualities of philanthropists, they're usually people of some means, financial means, with a pretty good education, often with a lot of connections, and with a certain amount of influence. If they are willing to um, lower their ego needs and not need to take individual credit, then it becomes possible to bring others who might be feeling a little bit less secure in society into the dialogue and to um, generate a dialogue that is actually really participatory. So using the influence and the convening power that they have, I think they can be what I like to think of as the venture capital of what society should be, which is more participatory, more concerned with each other's well-being and with the well-being of all sentient be beings. And this, in my view, for starters, is what I see as the future of philanthropy. You know, I. I couldn't agree with you more on the safe harbors point. Uh, you know, I uh, surf social media much more than I should to my wife's liking. <laughs> uh, she's actually thinking of uh, regimenting uh, how much I spend time on Facebook. Um, but it's amazing. Uh, 
uh, if you just look at uh, the amount of um, hate that you see on, on social media, you clearly realize that uh, media needs to find a way to create safe harbors for people to express themselves more freely. So I think clearly that's one thing that we need to. We've seen this explosion in, uh, uh, in, in creation of, uh, by, on account of technology in creation of, uh, of uh, open spaces, but we haven't found a way to regulate them, self-regulate them. Uh, in order to make people feel welcome. So I fully agree with you on that. Um, you know, Peggy, I wanted to push uh, one point that you, that you, uh, that you made. Uh, from your experience, uh, if you were to reimagine philanthropy or, or, uh, or expand philanthropy, um, what has, in your experience, been the greatest detriment to pushing people from an attitudinal perspective? Um, what, you know, what keeps people back? Fear. And what, what, what can help overcome that fear? So if I'm speaking specifically about philanthropists in the many societies where we operate, what I find is that because of, um, a tearing of the social fabric, <coughs> that people of wealth tend to isolate themselves behind bodyguards, behind bars, literally, in gated communities, and in order to feel safe. So we have to somehow shift that so that feeling safe isn't a matter of just building even further walls around oneself and one's life. And one of the things that we do, and in fact are here in India doing today, is we bring members of the Global Philanthropist Circle from other countries um, on guided learning journeys to other countries to learn what there is to be learned from that experience. So we've had about 12 people from different countries here this week interacting with Dazra, going on field trips, hopefully feeling safe, and um, having an opportunity to reflect among themselves, but also with the wider community, different sectors of society. So creating a sense of groupness among themselves, but then with the people that they're interacting, with whom they're interacting, I think is a beginning of a way to do that. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, uh, so I've actually spoken to even Bill Gates about this, and uh, he's actually traveled more in Bihar and, interact and visited Musahar villages, which are probably the most difficult parts of Bihar to travel in, and uh, most Indians would not, from urban areas, would not travel to those places. So what, why, why does he not fear going there? And why, do, why does the average philanthropist fear going to places that he doesn't fear? What well, switch do you think has he made in his mind? <laughs> I can't speak for him, actually. But what I would say, it's very interesting, because when we take people on learning journeys uh, from different countries, Ordinarily, the people from that country don't go. It's the people from other countries that are willing to do it in countries different from their own. Now, that may be that they've already seen the realities of their own country, but I don't think so most of the time. So it's, it's maybe, I'm not speaking about him now because he does have a unique personality and, and curiosity and willingness to do that. But I think very often, people are more familiar with the dangers of their own society, and so they're less likely to do it at home. I, I can tell you one thing that, uh, so I, I actually made a trip to a place which I feared for a long time, and I hadn't gone to, uh, which is an uh, area which is deeply uh, in, infested by people called Naxalites. Um, and uh, so I went to a place which was very close to their capital, uh, in November, um, and I realized that the, my best friend was anonymity. Um, so I went and spent a couple of days there, and I realized as long as nobody knew who I was, so I just said I was a social worker with the Tata Trust, <laughs> and because nobody knew who I was, nobody bothered me. Uh, so I wonder whether fear is often linked to people knowing who you are. Yeah, I think that certainly is true among people with big names, yeah. um, and it's understandable. Okay. Um, 
Um, I wanted to make one other point about technology, though. One of the members of the Global Philanthropist Circle is Charles Chen, or Chen Yidan from China, who founded Tencent. He's about 45. And part of what they're doing on their platform, it's like WeChat and WhatsApp, et cetera, is they're creating the potential for crowdsourcing. So China, like India, does things big. Yeah. And their first year when they launched, they raised $800 million just through crowdsourcing of people putting up what they needed and other people bringing in support. So there's an area where you don't even have to be personally interacting, but people actually follow what's going on and it, they're very likely to send a dollar, you know, in US terms. And it's a way of mobilizing support and engagement from the whole society. And I actually think, even though I generally feel that social media is a way of isolating us from personal contact, that this is a way of, in a different way, building, rebuilding the social, social capital. Yeah. Uh, Peggy, let me ask you uh, two more questions on the first theme, and then we can maybe move on to the other, other themes. How much in your mind um, does inertia play as a role in holding back people uh, from being more effective philanthropists, which is often you just don't get started and just defer it. Whereas in any other facet of lives, we have a bias for action uh, because there is a natural bias. In our businesses, we have a natural bias to, there's a re if we don't deliver, uh, shareholders will come after us. In our physical uh, life, if we don't deliver, we'll get out of shape. Uh, so there's, in most other things, there is a natural bias. But in the, in the philanthropic world, uh, there, isn't a, there isn't often an absolute target to achieve that people land up setting for themselves. So how much does that land up playing uh, as, a, you know, as a factor in, um, in, in holding people back? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to give a general answer to that. Um, I think probably in the case of some people, it's that they don't know what to do. In the case of others, they may still be concerned with making their fortune and not so much with giving it away. Um, but I also have the feeling that um, this business of being afraid and closing the heart, it makes it very difficult for them to take in what the needs are out there and then to think creatively and act on it. So part of the process of creating a safe container is uh, building the trust, creating a sense of belonging, and then going further into opening up into curiosity and creativity and imagination, which then generates a much more spontaneous, empathic, compassionate way of viewing the world, and that then is motivating people to get more involved. But that's, that's a process that takes time. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, your, your point, and I, and I would completely agree with that, is if you, if you deal with it in a manner in which you replace fear with, uh, with a positive uh, emotion, which is once you actually begin to do some uh, greater good with it, you can actually get the positive, mm -hmm. uh, positives of, of that greater good, which is there's generally a aha. Uh, you know, I, I know I asked, uh, uh, you know, Bill Gates this question when we were interviewing him um, for, uh, for, another, uh, for another panel, and he said one of the, one of the great highs he had was in, in you know, f solving polio. It was almost as if, you know, he had uh, in, invented windows. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure, I mean, at the end of the day, any, whether it's educating a child or, uh, you know, getting to uh, uh, solving any other problem in a the community, there is, a, there is some joy that comes out of uh, out of that positive, uh, out of that positive work. So, your your point is, so, you know, replacing that fear with a positive emotion is what keeps you then going and 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 makes you want to do more. Yes, and I, and I just want to add the the focus that we've been having um, today on impact and evaluation and all of that. I'm not trying to detract from the importance of that, but we're talking about the future. What what would could come next? And I think it's a softer side and a way of 
getting individuals more um, open so they can really come from their heart as well as their mind and also more open to collaborate with others. Got it. Um, so Peggy, moving to the next dimension, which is really thinking about, um, you know, how to solve problems, um, you know, and, and over the last decade or so, philanthropy has really evolved uh, and, and people have, you know, moved from pure grant making towards a little bit more purposeful uh, problem solving. Uh, you see mission statements are reading very differently. Uh, you know, the uh, areas in which people are working are actually shrinking and going much deeper. Um, what, what sort of advice do you have for folks in the room on, uh, on that? I mean, is it better to choose one area and go deep or, you know, should people be grant makers? Uh, what would be your own advice? Well, my own personal preference would be that whatever the passion that individual people have, whatever area they want to go into, that they think about how to approach it from what I would call a systems approach. And that means not by themselves thinking up the solution or the silver bullet, but rather engaging in a conversation with the different stakeholders to that problem so that they're getting the perspectives of many different people. And probably while they're getting those perspectives, they may actually be building a certain amount of bonding and trust among the group that they're consulting if it's done in a way, for example, taking trips, let's say you're talking about adolescent girls, going and visiting programs, looking at the worst circumstances, the best solutions so far, and, and talking to the girls, getting their perspective on what the issues are. So it's not so much a question of um, what particular approach, but how they decide how to get involved in the issue that they feel most passionately about. Which is, I think, uh, the issue of collaboration as well, which is really collaborating with uh, both like-minded people and collaborating with organizations which have a much more methodical and uh, you know, organized uh, uh, approach um, makes a lot of sense. Because I think at the end of the day, all of us want to see results. And I think um, the the one big switch I've seen is that you, the more you align yourself with something which, you know, going back to the point, it, you know, you see data which, which reinforces um, that you're on the right track, it, it actually gives you a lot of satisfaction. Yeah. Um, and I think therefore, uh, uh, it makes sense to uh, find those linkages with both like-minded people and organizations which uh, to affiliate with. And that collaboration, I think, tends to be extremely valuable. I think uh, one of the things that the social sector, at least in my view, was somewhat guilty about um, globally was excessive fra fragmentation. Uh, there were just way too many people trying to do too many things. Uh, and I think we are definitely seeing uh, in the last uh, couple of years some degree of consolidation of approaches uh, happening. Uh, and I think that was really needed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, you know, let's touch upon um, one last topic, uh, and then we can come to some closing remarks, uh, Peggy, on technology. How do you see technology really changing things uh, in the West in particular um, going forward? So. This isn't my area of expertise, so now I'm just kind of spinning out my thoughts. But um, I know a young woman who's living in London who's absolutely brilliant, and she has this way of thinking that if you could bring together people from design and people from technology and people from the arts and culture, which are three quite different brain types, and she's thinking of young people in their 20s, maybe their 30s, and have them present their completely out of the box ways of thinking and then see if you could weave the threads across those different areas that you might really come up with some different solutions. So I, when I hear that kind of thinking and that kind of optimism, I get very excited. It gives me a lot of hope for the next generation. 
who are so much better informed on technology than I am. So, Peggy, the world has some seriously rich people. In fact, um, you know, wealth is far outpacing um, poverty, right? Um, so, you know, we've at the same time we've got some really, really pressing problems, um, both in the east and the west. So, what's your outlook? Do you think? Um, Philanthropy is actually going to solve some major problems in the next 20 years. I mean, we think about reimagining philanthropy. Do you think we are actually going to solve problems? And which problems in your mind are most likely to be addressed by philanthropy? A tough, sorry, it's a curveball. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Um, well, first of all, we're still in the Kali Yuga. For those of you who aren't Indian, <laughs> it's when things get worse. Yeah. So on the one hand, and I've, I've had to try to come to terms with what does that mean? You know, because it's not supposed to end any time really soon. So I just came from visiting with a spiritual leader in the south of India and I had this conversation. And where the way I understand it is that whereas some of the conflicts, some of the injustices that exist in the world, the inequalities that are growing, are probably going to continue uh, for quite some time. That at the same time, the people, and I would say like a lot of us in the room, who are really trying to address those inequities and degradation of the planet and all of that in our own ways, we can do what we can do. And we will hold points of light that in the end are going to be the beacons that however many generations from now, if we actually don't cause ourselves to be extinct, the planet will then take care of itself. But if we can persist, those points of light will end up being beacons for when the shift comes. So we can only do that much. And there is a lot of darkness in the world. And the way that I maintain my sense of hopefulness is when I see people who are truly committed despite knowing that probably in our lifetime these things are not going to get solved. The, the larger trend seems to be with more conflicts, greater inequity. And philanthropists really are not going to be able to solve it on their own, which is why I hold out the hope for us to become bridging leaders so that we can bring others who are concerned, whether they have the same power and influence that individual wealthy people have, um, into the equation so that the group of us that is working together and moving in what we hope is a more equitable and sustainable direction will actually um, be able to make some difference and again, bringing in the issue of government. If we're gonna try to go to scale on any of this, we have to find ways to collaborate with our governments. That's terrific. Um, do we have time for questions or? We can probably take, we can probably take a couple of questions, so. <laughs> we can pass. Um, and if you can introduce yourself for the benefit of the audience as well. Uh, Amit, hi, it's Anshul. Hi, Anshul. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, tr I'm relatively new to philanthropy, and typically the image I've had in my mind is you have someone who's running or has run a successful uh, business, and with the wealth that's created from that, uh, channeling that those that fund and energy into serving the poorest of the poor or a fundamental problem. Um, but as I hear you speak, that actually what might be most effective is to look at a systems approach, which is to try and think about multiple stakeholders coming together in unique ways. That implies a, a slightly different model where you see maybe those promoters or um, business leaders, um, or, or leaders in general, <coughs> engaging in a very different way. Like you described the person in, in China, the, the founder of Tencent, mm -hmm. as opposed to giving philanthropy, actually leveraging that platform and their ability to create businesses to maybe come up with more innovative solutions that serve the poorest of the poor. Um, and I know, Amit, you've been involved, for example, in setting up a children's hospital, which is different than the philanthropy you have in supporting NGOs. So am I inferring too much, or do you actually see 
this change happening in, in, in the way philanthropy happens? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I mean, not that you're inferring too much. I, I do think that that's a way forward and that it'll have more of a multiplier effect than if we all just kind of give our individual money to causes. And, and there is room, as uh, Anant was saying earlier, there is room for addressing immediate needs as well. I don't want to set that aside, but I think it's more strategic and that we ought to be using our brains and our influence to try to create these collaborations that can come up with new solutions. Yeah, I just add to what Pe Peggy said. I personally believe that the word philanthropy is often mistaken to, uh, to be seen as the preserve of the wealthy. And I think that's exactly what I think you were trying to say in the beginning as well. I think uh, the gr I personally feel the greatest uh, contributions are actually often your uh, person skills. Um, and those are the ones that go the furthest. Uh, the work that I do with farmers in, uh, in central Maharashtra and drought prone regions, actually all, in all those cases, the, in each of those projects, the farmers actually contribute more than uh, philanthropists uh, you know, who co contribute to those projects do. And so I look at them as far more important philanthropists uh, than you know any one of us who support them uh, are so I you know I think uh, we should think of uh, of when we reimagine philanthropy we should actually think of this not just as capital and who's contributing how much and who's wealthy and who's not this should be seen much more from a capability perspective. The sign says stop. I think and it's big bold S T O P so. Thank you so much.